Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, John said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than me, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, burning up the shaft with unquenchable fire. The Gospel, the good news of the Lord. So we are in this season of Advent, just reminding ourselves this word Advent, meaning coming. And one of the things that we acknowledged last week when we asked the question, well, what is coming that we are to awaken to, to watch out for, to be alert for, is the growing darkness. We still live in a culture, in a, in a northern hemisphere, that this time of the year our days are growing shorter. We have less darkness to illumine our work, to help us to move out from our homes and through the country safely. Oh wait, that's not our experience, is it? The people who were hearing these messages, that was certainly their experience. And so I found myself this week continuing to reflect on this darkness, this growing darkness. And what does that invite us into as a people of faith? Because if we step back for a minute, it's clear that our culture is waging a war against darkness. We are addicted to light. We light up everything. Why? I was thinking back about 30 years ago, I, I went on a trip to the southwest with a good friend of mine. Three weeks we camped in all of the national parks and we ended up at Carlsbad Cavern. How many of you have ever been at Carlsbad Cavern? How many of you have ever been to a major cave system? Like, yeah, like mammoth caves or even bridal caves down in uh, the Ozarks. You know, um, my friend and I arrived just as it was getting to dusk. And I don't know if you know about Carlsbad, but there is a bat flight every night. And we got there just in time to see these million and a half bats 
flying out of the mouth of this cave, flying in a, in a clockwise formation, a million and a half of them, flying out as the sun sets to go out and feed for the night. And you could see them as far to the horizon as your eyes would carry was this line of bats going out to feed. It was thrilling. I love bats. I think they're fascinating. I know that they rise up in some people a natural fear, and I don't know what that's about, but I love bats. I'm fascinated by them. And I don't think they threaten us as people the way some of the stories have told us they do. But anyway, the next day, we came back to the cave, and my friend and I took a tour inside Carlsbad. And, it's, and I mean, the opening chamber is, you know, the size of this church. And they just keep getting bigger and awesome, you know, these stalactites and stalagmites. And you're surrounded by this natural phenomenon that's awe-inspiring. Well, our tour guide took us deep into the cave and went, took us into a side chamber, sat us down on a stone, and then turned out the light. darkness like I have never imagined. And, as, and I, I respond to like I imagine most people do. Initially, fear overwhelmed me. I'm, I was like, I can't even see my hand in front of my face. How would I ever possibly get out of here? Well, first question is, why would I ever go in there? But I was there. I was there. And I thought, if, if that person left right now somehow, I would not be able to negotiate my way out of the place. And that idea of darkness overwhelming me made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. And I became very aware of my heartbeat. It was pounding. But I just allowed myself to stay there. And our guide gave us 10 minutes in this room. And I finally started to settle down. And I finally started to get my breath under control. And I could feel the fear slowly leaving me as I asked myself, what is this darkness teaching me? What is this darkness offering me when my ability to see was removed? My other senses started to waken up. And I, had, I actually had my eyes closed in the darkness. And as I started to think about the fact that I was not alone, even though I felt completely isolated, completely cut off, I was not alone. And that, that message of the fact that our God is with us, that our God is coming into my life, that God is already in my life, I started to have this little dialogue with God. What do you want me to know in this darkness, God? And something really amazing started to happen. My eyes started to lighten up. I started to have this sensation of light illuminating my senses, my neurons started to fire. And I started to have images. And I started to see, not with my eyes, but with my imagination. And I no longer felt afraid. I almost felt courageous, like I could actually make my way out of this darkness. How many of you have ever asked what the darkness has to teach you? You know, I was, I was taken back to creation. One of the things that I don't know that we, that we really acknowledge is that in creation, if you notice, that day when God separates light from dark, God does not eliminate darkness, but darkness and light exist together to inform the creation of these two aspects of reality, these two aspects of light. We are, as creatures, invited to live in both of those realities, not to fight against the darkness, but instead to ask, what am I to learn from the darkness? Have you ever gone into a place and intentionally turned off all the lights 
and sat in the dark. As if you haven't, I would invite you to do that. If not tonight, sometime this week. Just sit in the dark and notice what happens. And if you fall asleep, notice what happens to your mind and your imagination and how God talks to you then in your sleep. Anyway, John the Baptist, preaching to us in our gospel today, is very aware of this phenomenon of darkness. And what John has started to associate is the experience of darkness when things that are going to go awry seem to happen. It's in the darkness that John seems to see his own sinfulness. He sees the sinfulness of humanity. He sees the sinfulness of the religious leadership, of the political leadership. He sees the sin of the nation. Because under the darkness of sin, humans can rationalize all sorts of things. People were coming out to John because they believed he was Elijah. That he was the one who had come back to them to announce the reign of God. And in order to be in the reign of God, they entered into those waters to be baptized, to be dipped in that river. And their sinfulness, that which separated them from God, from the covenant, was washed away. The people were coming out to John. But then those religious leaders show up. And it's at that point that John says to them, Now is your chance to name the darkness in you and to repent. To remorse fully express what has separated you from the people that you are called to serve. And what's their response to John? Oh, no thanks. We're good. We're the sons of Abraham after all. We've got the laws. Look at us. We're wealthy. We're blessed. We're doing all right, John. We don't need to repent. And John looks at them and says, Therein lies your sin. You don't even see that you are so separate from the people of God that you are called to serve and lead and bring good news to that you can even admit that you are sinful, that you are broken, that you are weak. You can't even admit it. Why? Because it's vulnerable? Why? Because something might change in you? You vipers. You poison the people with your attacks. You don't even see your own darkness because you haven't allowed yourself to be in it. Repent. Express your remorse. You know, culturally, we are very much like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What do we do during this month of Advent? Rejoice. Celebrate. Festive, festive, festive. Lights, lights, lights. And our scriptures are saying to us, no, acknowledge the dark and repent in order to actually appreciate the light. It's why we don't have our tree lit yet. Because first, we have to acknowledge and appreciate the darkness before we can fully appreciate the light. See, transformation, that which we're called to as Christians, the opportunity we have to have our lives changed and transformed and brought to fuller life, the true gift of Christmas, transformation, can only happen after we have named the darkness, after we have named our sin, after we have named our addiction. Only then 
can true transformation happen? When we've felt the pain and the absence and the fear and the pain we inflict on other people, transformation can only happen after we have sat with that and named it and made friends with it. That's what we are called to in this Advent season. To be in the dark. To truly open ourselves to the gift that is the light, that is the Christ. Isaiah named it for us. It's the, it's the light that we pray upon our baptized. It's up, when we have confirmation, the affirmation of our baptism, we pray about those gifts of Holy Spirit, the light that informs our lives, knowledge and understanding and right judgment, wisdom, courage, wonder and awe before God and a sense of reverence for creation. Those are the light that we are called to live into. They exist in the darkness that is around us. But we can only truly awaken to the light when we've acknowledged the darkness. And so I want to leave you with a quote today from Sister Joan Chittister. She's a Benedictine sister from Erie, Pennsylvania. She always refers to herself as the Erie Benedictine. Not eerie because she's quirky, but eerie because she preaches in a way that challenges people. She preaches gospel. And this is what she preaches when she's able to, as a Catholic woman. She preaches about darkness. And I offer her words to you today for your contemplation. There is a light in us that only darkness itself can illuminate. It is the glowing calm that comes over us when we finally surrender to the ultimate truth of creation, that there is a God and we are not it. Then the clarity of it all is startling. Life is not about us. We are about the project of finding life. At that moment... Spiritual vision illuminates all the rest of life. And it is that light that shines in darkness. Only the experience of our own darkness gives us the light we need to be of help to others whose journey into the darkness and the dark spots of life is only just beginning. It's then that our own taste of darkness qualifies us to be an illuminating part of the human expedition. Without that, we are only words, only false witnesses to the truth of what it means to be pressed to the ground and rise again. The light we gain in darkness is the awareness that however bleak the place of darkness was for us, we did not die there. We know now that life begins again on the other side of the darkness. Another life. A new life. After the death, the loss, the rejection, the failure. Life does go on. It's different. But life goes on. Having been sunk into the cold night of despair and having survived it, we rise to new light. Calm and clear and confident that what will be will be enough for us.